this week on Crossfeed. Paying Christians to visit Israel. Pastor, we don't need the pictorial directory. Because you're fired. The Muhammad cartoons are back. Take the sexy challenge. And what do you do when you leave the church? Welcome, everybody. I am Pastor James Butler of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. We're expecting eight inches of snow tomorrow. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa, where we have plenty of snow already. <laughs> Yesterday, I was uh, I was driving down to the hospital, and there was a um, basically, if you can imagine, you know, one of these big snow plow trucks. Except instead of having a plow on the front of it, it had a sort of giant snowblower blade, and and it had it was shooting snow out the top of it, and uh, and and but it was shooting it across the road onto the other side. They're trying to clear them out, uh, widen the highways because there's so um, there's so much snow that that as they're plowing them, it, the the snow's just kind of piling up on the sides of the highways, and um, and and so they've they've got nowhere to go when they try to plow, and so they they have to use these sort of giant snowblower trucks to clear some space to make room so that they can plow more snow onto the shoulders. They do that almost every storm up here. <laughs> well, we're used to seeing it, but you know, I'll two feet of snow to you know you know. 18 inches, two feet of snow, and that, that happens real quick. Uh, if you ever lived, you had a, a, a winter and there's 120 inches of snow. <laughs> well, that's we're, we're getting pretty close to that now. All right, 10 feet of snow, I believe it, in Iowa. Well, I've heard, um, I've heard 100, 100 inches being uh, thrown around. I haven't heard the exact number. I've got pictures of my children that are small, literally standing in a pile of snow in our backyard that was so deep, you could not see the hot snow huts. <laughs> it was uh, more than waist deep to me. Impressive. Wow. You could tell uh, it was so. Uh, so. Yeah, you, well, it's not that bad here. And then it all melted off, and then it all came back again. So, yeah. And uh, we had people's roofs caving in that year and ice dams, and uh, it was a messy old year. And it uh, hasn't been that bad up here this year. It would have been if the last storm we got had been all rain. Uh, otherwise, last week, but we can have to, we had two and a half inches of rain. And if that had been all hmm. snow, it would have been 30 inches of snow. I uh, see. It's been. The temperatures haven't gotten above zero very often around here, uh, so we don't get much rain. <laughs> See, that's uh, because of the ocean. We don't. Uh, we, we, it can get quite mild a lot of actually that day in the winter. And, uh, it, just, it depends where the storm goes. If the storm goes off the coast, then we get dumped out of the small east. But if it goes on uh, the, like up to upstate New York in that area, then we're on the warm side, and the warm air from the south comes up, and then we get our rain. So okay. it just, uh, all depends on the direction of the storm. But that's a little bit of climate history here in New England. <laughs> so where should we start today? Well, speaking of storms, uh, I think there's going to be one coming up uh, thanks to a certain uh, set of cartoons that are being republished. I don't know. Go ahead. Give him the background. Okay. Um, well, this is it's funny because one of the first articles that was ever posted at CrossFeedNews.com was about these cartoons. Um, and everybody remember about, what, two years ago uh, in in Denmark, there was a number of cartoons that were posted uh, that showed uh, – Muhammad 
and uh, it, there was rioting and all kinds of trouble. And uh, 12 different ones. And so the uh, where's it here? There was a uh, death plot and that's been taken care of. What do I think? I think they kill him. And so they want to reprint the, uh, the the cartoons now that the murder plot has been foiled. Well, actually, it's not that they want to reprint. They reprinted them. Or, or they did. Sorry. Sorry, folks. So now people are being upset again. Well, oddly, though, what we're not hearing about, though, is uh, any riots this time. Nope. And if you remember the last time, it was really kind of weird because the rioting actually took place, what, six months after they'd been printed? Yeah, yeah, it was weird. You know, it wasn't like it was the printed and they were going wild. No, it was several months afterwards that they, uh, uh, and, I mean, even here, once again, they're, they're talking rather, and the people there are talking rather calmly. Um, you know, yeah, here, they were first printed in September 30th, 2005. And then uh, what happened was it, they appeared in a bunch of other papers in early 2006, and that went, that's when it kind of exploded. Right. But it's just kind of interesting. Um, there was one that says, there could have been other ways to do it without drawing the without the drawing, which I personally do not like. Uh, said Abdul Fahim Peterson, a modern Imam. Yeah, Imam Mustafa Shined, leader of Islamic faith community, said his group was considering staging the rally about it. We are unhappy about the cartoons being reprinted. No blood would ever shed in Denmark and Texas. No blood will be shed. We're trying to calm people down, but let's see what happens. Let's open a dialogue. I mean, these people sound, you know, really uh, you know, radical. Though. Well, it sounds like they've learned from the past, or at least these were the guys that weren't involved in it. Right. Well, again, you know, where, where did the riots take place? They didn't take place in Denmark. And once again, there's a, there's a lot of good, moderate people out there. Um, and I'm going to be moving this so people, this, I'm, I'm moving the picture right in front of you there so people can see a good shot of that. Okay, now folks, Dale lives in Iowa. Okay, so anybody wondering, this, 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 Iowa. <laughs> Iowa, yeah. Iowa, um, where Cedar Rapids, is and that is the location of the first uh, mosque in the United States. Oh, okay, good. So, put that straight there. Okay, <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Don't blame me. I'm from Massachusetts. I have no control over the pictures he puts up there. Uh, actually, I I have the uh, shot of the. The page that depicted all of them. I'll throw it in during the closing uh, credits. I O W A. <laughs> Think Hawkeyes. Corn. <laughs> ethanol. Yeah. They have been drinking ethanol to put that picture up there after what you've been reading. I don't know. More well, time. it's so widespread nowadays that, uh, <laughs> and I, I haven't heard of any, you know, uh, any any webmasters being <laughs> punished for that one. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I will just remember that. <laughs> okay, here's the other question: Are there any uh, radical Muslims watching our show? I'm thinking not. <laughs> well, I don't know how many radical Muslims read the Danish newspaper either, but they, you know, somehow another wound up in Saudi Arabia. I suppose maybe we'll use this picture as the uh, as the artwork for the for the episode just to make sure to get people's attention. <laughs> anyway, but no, I just thought it was kind of uh, 
I, I don't know. I read this, and they said they were re reprinting them to show their affirmation of uh, free speech. I don't know. Like, really just like, I mean, I defended their right the first time. And I thought the writing was going overboard, and they should had no reason to take it down and things like that. But now it's just almost like they're poking your finger back in their eye. <laughs> You know, I'm just kind of wondering, is this the brightest thing to do? You saw yeah. what happened. So they, oh, no, they didn't get the, the, just the opposite thing. Like, you know, they didn't, nobody objected to, you know, somebody got a hold of these pictures later on. Let's see how long we wait this time. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what happens here if, if, if anything's going to happen again. I, I, personally, I, I kind of like the thought that, People have had a chance to calm down about it now. So hopefully this means that there won't be any more, any more of that kind of thing. Now uh, let's be reasonable. That's for sure. But let's find it. But we are talking about you know, people in the Middle East. Uh, my son can tell you uh, what to do. He said they live in mud huts and they have satellite dishes. <laughs> Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. He says that. Well, he can't figure it out. He cannot figure it out. What's going on over there. Uh, but that's our good friends over there. Maybe, hopefully they have a little peace. Um... Well, as long as we're talking about things over in the Mideast area, let's go ahead and talk about what's going on in Israel. Yeah. This is actually, it's, it's what's going on in India, sort of. Because the, um, the Andhra Pradesh government of, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. Reddy, uh, is his name, is, has decided that they want to give out subsidies to Christians who want to visit holy sites in Israel. They already do it for the Hajj, the visits to Mecca for Muslims, and so they want to do the same thing for um, for the Christians too. Okay, lady, I love you. Bye bye. I love this. Always eager to offer a sock to minorities. Uh, uh, what a way to put it. I mean. <laughs> That's, 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 I couldn't figure out if this is a news article or an editorial uh, with comments like that. You know, I just thought, man, what a great, uh, what a great. Hey, we don't write like that in America. No, no objectivity there. <laughs> oh. I, I think it's kind of interesting in that it just kind of, you know, talked about religious neutralism. You know, well, we, you know, get money to Muslims to go over there if they want to. Well, we'll get money to Christians to do the same thing. So I, thought, you know, I don't understand why they do either one. Well, I don't I mean, understand why they do either one either, but if they do one, at least they're doing the other. Right, yeah, it's consistent. But at the same time, I'm looking at it and I'm going, you're paying people to go to, to go do tourism in another country. Yes, that's my daughter's cell phone ringing in the background. But she's not home right now. <laughs> Great. I love it. It's a wonderful sound back there. Yeah. So I don't, uh, this looks like a um, political move to me. Oh, well, he says that it's a... Uh, the sop to Christian pilgrims by the chief minister, himself a Christian, is seen as another move by the Congress government to woo minorities ahead of the general and subway election scheduled for next year. Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? So. I just love, I just love this. I, I love the comments on this one. This is great. I'm like the Hodge, which is a protected environment in which these thousands of pilgrims from all over the world every year 
holy sites in Israel, including disputed Jerusalem, are located in a virtual war zone. It's unlikely that more than a few Christians from India and the state will want to visit. Uh, said the opposition leader. That's probably true. Although, thousands of Christians go over there every year. Yeah. Um, and I had a picture in my first church, I had a picture of a woman, remember that church, coming up there, standing right behind, right between two Israeli defense force guys with their uh, Uzi machine guns. <laughs> so it's, it's a very protective environment too, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, I I know people that go over there um, a couple times a year, and um, you know they they say, well, you just make a point of only going to um, the places that are not under heavy fire. Yeah. But like you said, I don't know why they give you know subsidies to anybody. To do this stuff. Doesn't make sense to me. But that's government. You know, pander to the voters. It's just, you know, I, I'm voters. looking at it. You'd think you'd want to encourage tourism into the company or into the country, not out. <laughs> yeah, you know, give uh, give subsidies to people that want to. There's there's Christian sites in uh, in India. Yeah, you go where Thomas the early, got his skin off. Uh, Christian church there and stuff. They should be. See, yeah, there you go. So they should be doing that instead. That would kind of make for a weird tourism thing, but I don't know. I think it's pretty weird already. So what are you gonna do? I don't know what you're gonna do. Uh, well, let's go from there. Let's go to. Speaking of vacation places, let's go to Tampa, Florida. The swallow may fly south with the sun. Okay, are you kids in bed before we get into this one? Are they too hmm. They were gone. Uh, which... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is going to be another one of those episodes. <laughs> Many people may not put the words sex and church in the same sentence, but this isn't your traditional religious experience. This church has issued a sex challenge to its congregation. Here's News Channel 8's Katie Coronado. You may not expect to see this driving down the highway, but you may not expect to hear this sitting in church. We're launching into our 30-day sex challenge. We wanted to be able to help couples, both married and single, to really refocus their their sex lives around what, what God's principles are. Paul Worth. Pastor of Relevant Church in Ybor City says he came up with the idea because so many people have brought up the issue, no time for sex. He says married people should try to have sex for 30 days, but single people also have a challenge. They will have to abstain from sex. The 30-day sex challenge is open to everybody. There's even a website promoting it. A few people have already signed up. Between life, the house, the kids, the business, sometimes how this whole thing got started gets kind of forgotten. So that's what I'm most excited about. I'm, I'm excited about that, that refocusing time for us. Single people are also taking the challenge. We're asking single people to say, take a break from sex. Maybe take a sex detox for 30 days. Even if they live together? Even if they live together. Even if they've been together for years? Even if they've been together for years. Because maybe the sex for them has been the central theme of their relationship, and maybe they're missing a part of it. Jarrett Hawes says even if a sexy girl tempts him, he won't break the challenge. I want to be able to say, you know, whenever I do finally find a wife one day, um, hey, I did this for you when I was 26 years old. And while this will be a tough assignment for some... I'm up for the challenge. You're edit this, right? <laughs> Others say they'll enjoy the positive outcome it may bring to their relationships. In Tampa, Katie Cornell. In Tampa, Katie Cornell. I don't know. Um, and, I, and I have mixed thoughts on this. All right. Okay, Paul Worth of Relevant Church. Well, let's okay. Well, let's I explain love first. Name. Relevant Church. Um, how much more in yep. your face and insulting to other churches so. you can get? You're not relevant. We are. You're all here because you're the best of the best. Yeah. <laughs> and you know um he has we interrupt your regular broadcast to bring you this important news go ahead. go ahead okay um he has offered a 30-day sex challenge uh to 
try to combat the 50% divorce rate in the nation. And basically, here's how it goes. If you're married, you need to, um, if you decide to take up this challenge, you need to have sex with your spouse for every day for 30 days straight. If you're single, you need to abstain for 30 days straight. Any monkey business is ill-advised. That's the gist of it. And so, okay, now first off, most of you are probably thinking, okay, if you're single, shouldn't you abstain for, like, more than 30 days? (laughs) Okay, but his rationale is that, obviously, if if you are um, remaining celibate, um, as a single, then you should continue, not just like, okay, 30 days from now, you can start up. But he's saying a lot of singles never even consider, uh, you know, refraining. And so he's saying, get out of the habit. You know, learn how to say no. But if you're so, part of the congregation, shouldn't you figure this out somewhere? But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and um the idea is also for uh for married couples to he says hey, you know this is an important part of your marriage and and so get in the habit of it and so it's all about establishing habits yeah well i like this you know we're, we're sitting in the church one day we heard about this uh challenge um uh, at least that's perfect we could do anything for 30 days I think we could get into it. We're like, we could certainly do this for 30 days. <laughs> this church member is Doug and Marina Weber. I, I wouldn't want to go up there and take it to... Yeah, my wife and I are getting it on every night for... I'm, why are you going on a new thing in the morning saying this? I mean... <laughs> yeah, that's really not what people want to think about with their pastors. You know, I mean, um... Well, I like this... this this, this, this word, Paul Worth, he believes most people go into marriage without really knowing each other emotionally, without knowing each other partner's emotional needs. Uh, this the challenge is a way for people to discover their greatest needs, both married and non-married couples. You know, I'm going to say something more about, I'm going to sit people talking about other people's emotional needs. And you've really got to understand them to be getting married. People all over the world go into arranged marriages and live with it the rest of their, their entire life. You know, I was uh, just reading yeah. about a... Uh, and don't get divorces. Yeah. I, um, up here, there's a, just an article in the Boston Globe not too long ago about a, you know, Indian um, computer programmer. You know, she's like, you know, 27, 28 years old and getting ready to go to India to marry some guy she's never met. I'm going to marry that man. And well, we have the, the re-virginizing people there, yeah. too. Yeah. So, I mean, people do this. They just go out and get married and stay married. You know, I just, I just, I, I get so tired of our, our over-psychological, psychologizing. You know, it's like, you know, the, it's, instead of being the church where, you know, the local therapeutic center for it. I'm not crazy. Well, you know, the problem is that people don't understand what love is and don't understand what marital vows are. Because when you get married, you promise to love your spouse. That doesn't mean I promise to have this ooey-gooey feeling about my spouse. It means I promise to be faithful to my spouse no matter what, no matter who comes along, you know, no matter whether I want to or not. It means that I'm going to see to my spouse's needs, whether I'm in the mood to do that or not. Now, that and does raise no the whole question the of sort of, okay, where, where are the limits of that? I have no idea what that meant. I mean, you know, you could ha- you could have a whole discussion about, all right, okay, if you're if your your spouse is is hungry, would you you know give them something to eat? Okay, um, you know, most people say yes, or else they tell them to go get it themselves. But you know, <laughs> for the most part, you know, or say, boy, I'm just I've had really had a bad day. I re- I just need a hug. You know, would you give them a hug? Yeah, 
I would think so. Okay. Well, what if they say, oh, man, you know, now, you know, <laughs> do you fulfill that yeah. need? You know, I and him. I offer. Okay. Well, what if you're not really in the mood to, you know, I offer. Remember that. I offer. <laughs> All right. (laughs) I mean, here's the thing, though. You have to look at it in the sense that whole, we've talked about this before, the the role of the husband, the role of the wife, in the sense of, um, you know, husbands love your wives, and, and as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. You know? And so that means that you're not always going to have your, your needs open. And, and one of the problems with this program, this challenge, is that you can have, um, for instance, husbands, they can be husbands or wives, um, who will say, oh, pastor says that we should do it tonight. And, you know, and like she's had a, a long day and she's exhausted and she just wants to go to bed and go to sleep. And, and he's like, oh, no, nope, you're not a good wife if you don't, you know. <laughs> and like, you know, there's a... And, there's a real um, potential to abuse this. He's just waiting for day 31. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, folks, you uh, notice there's a packet catch up there. You notice there's a slight delay there. And then all of a sudden, Dale is uh, speaking a mile <laughs> a minute there. The package just got caught up to us. And I think they're going to delay the I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I'm just so tired of, of churches feeling like it has to be something to be relevant. Uh, you know, or, you know, this is really taboo. You know, I feel like, okay, now we got to touch a taboo subject to show our, our relevance. I mean, this is like the, the church last year, a year ago we talked about, uh, you know, that we're doing the, the Pierce. The one in Michigan. And, you know, one in Michigan. Yep. I get tired of this stuff, you know? Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, like, like they're out there looking for ratings. Yeah, basically, because you look at when they do this kind of stuff. Look, they make the national news. Hey, we're talking about them. You know, <laughs> not that we're the national news, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh... <laughs> you know, you made a big when we're talking about you. We're talking about you. <laughs> but I mean, there, there's a lot of of, of problems. I mean, with this, I, I don't have a problem with, incur- although like during Lent, why is it they always do this stuff during Lent? <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, remember, there you go. Was it last week that we talked about take up something for Lent? <laughs> Iowa. Iowa. <laughs> Now we got it. No, now we got Dale figured out here, folks. Corn squeezing. See, and romance. Yeah, that's gave, his idea. Of, uh, that's that's lead for Dale. Chief gave up alcohol for lead. So did I. I'm just giving it to my wife instead. <laughs> Boy, no control. Give it something to her anyway. <laughs> I didn't say we were taking this challenge either, and I don't think anybody out there wants to know anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the other problem with this is there, there's actually a very practical problem with this uh, for most couples. All right? 30 days. All right? Sometime within that 30-day period, there is going to be a period where a lot of people are going to be sort of uncomfortable with this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> this, you know, this just, uh, aside from, you know, there's a lot of, of issues with this, but, the, you know, that's a very practical one. Too much information. <laughs> I'm just saying, From you know, you got to think, oh, if, <laughs> if you're going to be suggesting something like this and encouraging something like this and, you know, and essentially sort of giving the impression at least, and I, mean, I don't think this is the, the intent, um, but sort of, you know, people, certain people are going to get the impression that you're saying, well, this is, if you're a good Christian, you'll do this, you know. Um, 
but they you got to be you got to make sure that it's practical and you know what I bet you they let these couples get their pictures in a electoral directory and they wouldn't fire the pastor for it either see we're going to move on <laughs> To our other favorite topic that we have to speak on this thing all the time, and that is homosexuality. How many, I mean, it's like almost every week we kind of get these, you know, another one or two stories about you know, um, uh, churches and homosexuality, and this is the Broadway Baptist Church in Fort Worth. I don't know how it's big their a this is, but somehow or another, I get the idea this is not probably a mega church in, in Dallas. Uh, no, they, I, I went to their website, and they only have one pastor. Okay. So, so, so uh, and he's a liberal guy. He he calls himself moderate, but he, he was going to have Marcus Borden preach. I mean... Oh, that's not right. No. Borden is a lot of liberal to get. I mean, he can, you know, completely denies the divinity of Jesus. I mean, he's, he's way out there. And, uh, but anyway, so, this, uh, there at this, uh, Broadway Baptist Church, which is 125 years old, and for the 125th anniversary, uh, they are doing the pictorial directory. They always called in early mills, and they're going to do the free things and stuff, and all that kind of good stuff that you do. And, um, Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. Uh, Anyway, gay, gay people have long been part of the congregation, <laughs> and it kind of don't ask them our policy. No, we're not homosexual, but we are willing to learn. And uh, so they have these gay couples, and when it's time to go for the pictures, some of the gay couples show up, and um, suddenly people say, well, this goes beyond welcoming and it's affirming. So we're not going to tell them, you know, <laughs> kiss up to this point, though. It's just like, there's no, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but now it's in the directory. And so... Well, yeah. we don't then all of a sudden it's on paper. Yeah, so it's on paper. And now this is, might be a bad thing. It's just me. It's just some of the hypocritical. So, um, so now and the thing is, they're still not addressing the problem. They're saying, well, okay. We just won't have any family photos. We'll just have all individual shots. Then you can't have any argument about what's a family and what's not. <laughs> um, that's not really fixing the problem. <laughs> all right. I want to know who, who, who where they're going to get the, the uh, um, the company, the company, you know, they, they want to do a directory that have photos of church groups, but no family photos. Uh, that's one of the ideas of doing the directory is the family photos. Cause that's where they make the money. Right. I mean, I don't know if you've had any done the pictorial directory in your church. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and yeah, they give it free to you, but then, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they sell. A hard sell. So. Yeah, they do a hard We were lucky last time. The people who did it here were, were very soft so. Uh, Who did you time. get? It was actually somebody from Owen Mills, but they actually did it. They were very soft sell. Had another opportunity to Owen Mills, and they were very hard sell. So it just depends on the, the salespeople you get. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the other group that, that, that we had have worked with before. But yeah, but anyhow, you know, I got news for you. Owen Mills and those companies are interested in doing a directory of church group photos. They want the families. That's where they make their money. Yeah, the the church directory is just an excuse to for them to come and take everybody's picture. The other thing I thought was kind of interesting about this story, beyond that, is uh, then you know the next part is that there's uh, however many members this church has, I don't know how many of them, but they got 162 members signing a petition saying that. Uh, he should vacate the pulpit. And uh, basically then, uh, what we would call it, Newton Hill, we send his call. Yeah, but then more than 200 members signed a statement opposing the effort to oust them. So they have they have at least uh, 362 members. 
whether that's the actual church is another question. But that's another question. But, but I, I like it. You know, Dr. Younger referred in his summer Sunday sermon to efforts to fire me. I'm like, that's really nice. You just stand up in the pulpit and say, you know, some of you people are trying to fire me. I mean, that, that is just real class. Uh, it seems to me, even if there's some, you know, difficulty and stuff, and even if some people are trying to, to remove you from the pulpit, uh, or, you know, you seem to call for whatever reason, you don't stand up in the pulpit and, you know, basically use that as an opportunity, you know, as a goal pulpit to sit there and attack the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think he was offered $50,000 by some members if he would resign. <laughs> Well, so far you got to you get a bit. You got 162 who said we want we want him removed, and you got another 200 say we we want him kept. He's done a very nice job of splitting that congregation so far. <laughs> yeah, that he has. Yeah. <laughs> He's created a great rift. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure if you know the vote comes 200 to 162, he's going to stand up and say, "I was vindicated. I won." Yeah. Yeah, and meanwhile, the church splits. I mean, my rule, I'll be honest with you, I had, you know, close, I don't know how big the church is again, but if I had you know, that kind of number, you know, complaining about me, you know, I would seriously think about resigning, um, just because I don't want damage to damage the church. Of course, the problem gets to the end, you people go, you ran him out of here. You know, you ran the past this. You know, well, it sounds like this church needs more help than this pastor can give. I'm not saying that he should necessarily leave, but um although if you know he's encouraging uh gay couples and that, I don't know. But the I mean it's it sounds like this congregation's pretty divided on some pretty major issues and they really need a, some kind of reconciler or something like that to come in and, and help them work through these things. Well, I, th I think there's some deep theological issues, and I think some people, you know, I think some people, it's, it's interesting because they say they're, they're, uh, they have a massive organ, they're more liturgical than uh, most Baptist churches, um, it's more classical in their style, uh, they have women serving as deacons and ministers. So I think, you know, this is this is a group that probably... You know, there's a, people, a lot of people there who are a little bit more moderate than the typical Southern Baptist is. But at the same time, he, I think they're feeling like he's pushing it too far. You know, he's pushing some things that, you know, they, they think is not biblical. They'd be right. <laughs> well, they would be, but... You know. Just saying. Yeah. I, I, but I think, it, you know, it, it, apparently they're fir very affirming of, of uh, women's ministry. They're very affirming of, of, of a you know, liturgical style, which is unusual for a Baptist church. Um, but they are not um, affirming of something that's very late and bit under the book. Yeah. So, I, it sounds like nobody's really quite sure how to handle this. I mean, you've got people trying to sign petitions to keep them and get rid of them. That's not going to solve anything. Um, you know, the, the, it, it's almost like, I mean, the, everybody knows what the issue is, but everybody's skirting around how to deal with it. It sounds like they really need uh, to have some sort of leadership, of like a, a district president or, or something like that, uh, to come in and kind of sit everybody down and, and talk things through. And because the pastor's in the middle of it, he can't be the one to do it. But the, 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 the big issue it comes down to, there has been a basically crowd acceptance of homosexuality that hasn't been put out there, and it's kind of tolerated, and now all of a sudden, you know, when it comes to showing the pictures in the directory, oh, we don't want to do that. Now we've got an issue because it has been dealt with in a typical way to this point. Um, now all of a sudden, uh, you know, now they got a crisis. Okay. Now, let me throw something out because I haven't been controversial enough tonight. <laughs> Iowa. All right. 
Okay. You know, we look at this and we go, oh, gay couples in the picture directory. How horrible is that? All right. Now, how many of you out there look through your picture directory? Are there any uh, families in there that where they have unmarried couples? You know, maybe there's a couple that's been together. They're not married, might have kids, and uh, and haven't dealt with that. So you know, it's it's easy to point fingers here, but I'll bet you I could go through a whole bunch of of uh, very conservative churches and find these kind of things because we don't like dealing with that kind of stuff either. I got a bad feeling about this. Iowa. Now I know what Gail's got going in his church, folks. <laughs> That's what all romance and unmarried couples living with kids right around the church. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's one of those things that you you try to address that issue, and people get up in arms. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be addressed. It absolutely should be addressed. Uh, frankly, it should be addressed, you know, long before kids come along. Um, or, you know, as soon as they have the same address, it needs to be addressed. Um, but it isn't always. And especially when a pastor comes into a congregation where it's already going on. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you get there, you look through the directory, you, and you see this and you go, oh. You know, second day here, I'm going to deal with this. But then, after that, it's easy to put it off. I mean, I don't like an interesting way where pastor or other people are living together and they're going to pass your test and you walk in the number and you're going to baptize the woman. And it's like, you know, this is the okay thing. I'm just going to shock the heck out of me. Um, <coughs> I have never had it. Well, I did my explanation a couple of things when we've been together, but um, I started giving it up right away. I have had two or three couples who are unchurched and coming to me about baptizing their child and, you know, having to work with them as a lot like, well, let's talk about what's going on here. You know, what's your spiritual life? Well, um, is what you're doing that kind of season. And those kind of things. But I've, I've really dealt with it more with people who, you know, were outside the church. Uh, and, you know, now kind of looking to begin their spiritual life again. Rather than people who are, you know, in the congregation. Mm -hmm. So I did have a couple. I, I don't know if I get this one woman. She was a widow and I did, I'd done her husband's funeral and we were, Actually, we went, we got a Bible class together and, and grief and stuff, and she was just a real, and she, you know, met this guy and, uh, stuff, and he made all these promises that she's very, she's very good in this stuff, and everything, and then, Pastor, I know that this isn't what God means, but, somehow or other, God gave her a special dispensation. Hmm. I lost a good friend over there. Although she came back later on, so yeah. Well, I thought she was giving up everything. She wasn't giving up, even giving up anything. She was right. She said, I was compromised. She, she didn't compromise. She didn't believe the aging floor. didn't believe the end. I did. I can Yeah. Of course, now. It'd be more interesting if this guy had to be United Methodist. Where is this? New Zealand? Is this is that what this, this is? Oh no, this is coming out of South Africa. Yep. Okay, this one's coming out of South Africa. This is just kind of interesting. But, uh, there's a former Methodist, Kevin Light. And he challenged the, the Methodist Church of South Africa's position on um, same-sex unions. And uh, he 
quit and turn and start focusing on non-religious movements at some point. He, um, he, he, there was a media ban placed on him, uh, in 2007 when he had a God is gay breakfast. And, uh, so, I mean, you know, he was, <laughs> he could have preached at that other church. Um, but he describes himself as a slightly liberal theologian. <laughs> Well, so I'm, I'm not exactly is, sure. He has, has converted his attention to the labyrinth movement, which offers a concept of spirituality rather than religion. I love how those words are thrown around. And everybody has their own ideas of what spiritual means and what religious means. So people tend to say, I'm spiritual but not religious. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm 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 against organized religion. What you prefer disorganized religion? <laughs> well, it, it allows people to explore spirituality without the institutionalism and instruction associated with religion. So instruction just is a bad thing. Some people might have been hurt by religion or find spirituality a different way. It can be in cooking or running the forest. So. No, that's adrenaline. I mean, I, 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 I go on the treadmill for two and a half miles every morning. Um, that's not exactly, I wouldn't call it a spiritual experience. Very much. <laughs> it doesn't get you closer to God? I suppose on a treadmill, it doesn't get you closer to anything. <laughs> Hell would be filled with treadmills. <laughs> um, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I've lost 15 pounds since the first of the year, so 15 way to go. You ever see the video for, um, it's a, a band called OK Go, no. and the name of the song is Here It Goes Again? I, I, I have it. I'm not going to paste it at the end of the show or anything, but um, go everybody go to YouTube if you haven't seen this, and, uh, and, and just type in OK Go, Here It Goes Again. And you'll find it because it's one of the most popular videos ever on there. And um, it's a treadmill music video. It's really cool. Okay. It's it's choreographed, and they've got like six or eight treadmills. It's awesome. But back to South Africa here. I'm, yeah, sorry. I don't know. Once again, we have, you know, the brave liberal outfit. Look, if you don't, if you couldn't just think so, I think we should have some good things. But the nomination says we don't. Then do it. Mm -hmm. Just admit what you believe is not what the church believes. That's probably what he came down to, you know. You know he's just 19 to fight. No, he's, nine, you know, he's a guy who probably determined, I'm not really Methodist, I'm not. I don't really believe any of this stuff, do I? Well, you know. If he thinks that you can get just as close to God by uh, cooking as you can um, by, for instance, um, reading God's Word, yeah, that's that's a little different. Oh, very nice, Blaine. So the thing is, God has promised to be in His Word. He. And while you could you could argue he's promised to be in food too, that's only in a very specific circumstance called the Lord's Supper. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, God has been, God is present. His word present. His word read. His word preached. His word been physical. Baptism. That's where God's word. That's where God is spoken. I forgot has promised us to do that. And I see what being God is doing. So, you know, if God wants to, you know, give somebody some kind of special, extra, you know, or extraordinary vision of himself, he can do that too. So I think that they get by and tell you something. I like people hiking in the woods. Just, just, believe it or not, there's a huge nature reservation right in the middle of Boston in this two blocks from the house. And wonderful to go hiking up those, those hills and those mountains and stuff. 
stuff to do. She's just really a great place to go, go hiking and spend, spend some time. But, yeah, I guess I feel close to God doing that. You know, I mean, uh, or you know, I went hiking up in uh, the, the Green Mountains of Vermont and the, and the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And I'll tell you, you climb up one of these mountains and you get up there and you look over, I look down on the valley. Yeah, it, it is, it just, ah, it's an awesome sight. This, this is gorgeous. And you really do, you know, feel really close to God. But that's not a, but that does not, you know, substitute. Or feeling, believing, and interesting God's will, where God himself promises to do that. Of course, I stand up there and I look at the wow, what a beautiful world God has made. Somebody else might stand up there and go, wow, what a beautiful world that evolved and was, you know, happened to be made by uh, some glacial removal uh, of movements. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On, on that note, I have to mention this. Um, you heard about the satellite that was uh, in the decaying orbit, and and they shot it down with a missile. All right. All right. We put a satellite up in the air. We use you know computers and very precise instruments or whatever to put it up there. All right. But as soon as that satellite is put in its orbit, it is they can tell you when that orbit is going to decay to the point that that satellite is either going to go fly off into space or else it's going to come crashing to the earth right i mean and they know they they do their best to you know to get it just in the the exact right spot but they know that that's not going to stay up there forever all right now meanwhile the theory goes that the moon is there because uh some asteroid came crashed into the earth and knocked a huge lump of mud uh which is uh, where the the Pacific Ocean is now, um, out into space, and it it went out just right that it ended up um, it, it it hardened up um, and uh, and became the moon and and got just the right orbit so that it is in a perpetual rotation around the Earth and the orbit is not decaying. Um, and and well, maybe it, it it may either crash or uh or fly off into space in billions of years. Um, it's not going to be any time soon. And it was random. And then you look at all the other planets in the solar system that also have moons. Uh, not all of them have moons, uh, but uh, you know, they're. They're out there, and their moons are circling around them just fine. They're not decaying or, you know, going flying off or whatever. And um, and and they all just kind of got there randomly, and just kind of it, it just when when I was hearing about this, it, it just kind of struck me that well, wow, God's pretty good at placing those satellites in orbit, isn't he? Well, that old darn asteroid got dang lucky. You know, the other <laughs> thing that gets me though reading this. Yes, it's all the is how we do not react when someone comes. He said he's got numerous emails calling him Satan Spawn. You know, I was like, I mean, does that accomplish anything? Nope. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, to say, sir, I read this about you. This is what God says. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or however you want to. I remember what kind of. So, gave a, a, a speech. He said something about homosexuality being wrong. And a homeless guy called me who had been gay in his life. And I uh, was, uh, was a. Actually, yeah, it was a sermon actually about the area. So he called me, and you know, was really upset with what I said. He was in a really you know, hard, hard time of enjoying the service and stuff after that, and so mm-hmm. graduation. So I addressed it and I talked about it and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, I was in my head, and I got my son, and I said, "My God, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
ってことだった。それは。だから、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うように、今言うanother guy who went home and told me is, well, yeah, I know that's what God says. I know that's what the Bible says. I just don't think it applies. Yeah. Yeah, when Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, he didn't mean instead of going to church. <laughs> and, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's interesting, too, that this guy's Methodist, considering you think, you know, Methodism started out as a holiness movement, and a reform movement within the Church of England. Um, <laughs> it's taken a completely different form, though. Completely different form. But again, but here you get the good Methodist quadrilateral. So, you know, what is the basis for Methodist doctrine? Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. All on the level. So, you know, If your reason, your tradition, and your experience all weigh against scripture, but hey, I got three votes against one. Yep. You know, and that's important of always letting this speak with scripture alone. Even if it violates everything else. But maybe you all have another thing. You knew I was going to say this, right? Because I always say this to people. Maybe you were the book of Crypto Iowa. <laughs> and go see Dale. And drink some ethanol with him and find out about his life experiences. I don't know. For each month. If this is yeah, or maybe you want to watch him. Yeah. Maybe you want to, you know, find his first in <laughs> Delaware, Iowa. You can, you, oh. you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or you can call our voicemail line at 206-350-4749. But Dale would really hate it if his first phone call was a death threat. He really would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, although if you're going to send a death threat, I would rather get it as a voicemail than in person. I'm funny that way. <laughs> And, um... oh, speaking of uh, of messages, this wasn't a death threat. It was actually a thank you note. Uh, we got an email from Lorraine, who won the, the hymnal. And she says, Thanks again, guys, for the hymnal. It arrived the day after our Ash Wednesday blizzard. Incidentally, I'm listening to your episode from February 7th. You're talking about giving stuff up for Lent, or rather taking things up. I started doing that a number of years ago. One of, one of those years, I decided to give up 15 to 20 minutes a day for a small Bible reading. I have to say that it was the best thing I've ever done, and it was one of the major turning points in my spiritual life. It turned out to be much more meaningful than giving up cookies or cheese or something like that. Actually, I don't know if I would be able to give up cheese. She is in Wisconsin, after all. So she says, thanks again. I so, think um, cheese. It's the bratwurst. I'm sure she'd be able to get it. So, Lorraine, thanks for the note. Um, I was thrilled to get that. So, so uh, otherwise, folks, oh, shout out to our sponsor. PDAPerformance.com makes, uh, no, uh, it was about a week or two ago. There was a survey done. They found that Palm OS uh, users are among the most dissatisfied uh, users because they're they're just not real thrilled uh, with Palm. All right, but PDA performance users are um, tend to be very satisfied with their products. <laughs> so while you might have trouble with your Palm. Um, and I, I love my Palm, except for the fact that it crashes on me several times a day. But I think that's because of some other software that I have installed on it that I'm just uh, too addicted to to get rid of. So, but we thank them for providing our hosting and bandwidth. And we thank you for listening. And pray then that uh, you have a good weekend. 
And we will see you next week. Good night, everybody. God bless.